Good morning. Welcome to this Caixin debate. My name is Wang Shuo. I am the managing director of Caixin Media. I'm very honored to be the moderator of this debate. And uh, all the discussion will be conducted in English. Editor of Caixin Media. And we are going to discuss One Belt, One Road, the global implications. It's a key issue with systematic impacts across the international economic integration process. Today we have very distinguished speakers. To my left is Danny Alexander, and he is the Vice President and the Corporate Secretary of AIIB, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. To his left is Mr. Zhang Tao, he's a Deputy Managing Director of IMF. In the middle is Minister Anne Sim. She's a senior minister of Singapore, uh, overseeing Ministry of Cultural, Community and Youth, and also Ministry of Trade and Industry. To the further left is Hort Peters. He's a senior advisor to UPS Asia Pacific and incoming UPS China president. Um, last but not least, Minister Asan Iqbal. He's a Minister of Planning and the Development of Pakistan. Welcome. Thank you for coming. We know that the key to the Belt and Road Initiative is connectivity. Connectivity along multiple dimensions among participating countries, including policy coordination, facilities connectivity, unimpeded trade, financial integration, and the people-to-people -people bond. It's a beautiful and ambitious vision, especially at a time when the whole world seems to be sliding into more fragmentations. So the question is, what regional and global partnership are required to realize a successful and inclusive One Belt, One Road initiative? So consider of your reply to this question as your opening statement. How about we start from the two ministers from the Belt Road countries? Uh, Minister Iqbal, please go ahead first, then Minister Singh. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me say that One Belt, One Road uh, vision is a very powerful vision in today's world because we see that after it, to 10 years of the depression and the global crisis, the developed economies are still struggling to uh, find growth path. And there is a slowdown in the global economy and the demand is low. So if we have to go to the higher growth platform, we need more demand. Now demand will only come from the markets. So if the markets are saturated, we need new markets. To go to new markets, we need connectivity. So this is a very powerful concept where through uh, connectivity we connect people, markets, produce new demand and that leads to new growth. And in the process it touches the lives of millions of people who are cut off from the mainstream of development and that is what makes it very inclusive. In Pakistan we started this journey in 2013 with signing of China-Pakistan Economic Corridor MOU under One Belt, One Road. And within two years, it has translated into a portfolio of about $50 billion. And what we are witnessing is that it has brought billions of dollars of investment in the poorest and the remotest areas of Pakistan, where it is making a big difference in the lives of the people. It has provided them connectivity through better road network, opened up areas. The hinterland is connected to the coastal areas. It is also touching their lives through socio-economic development projects. Uh, there is a new fiber optic cable that is giving digital connectivity to the remotest areas. Uh, and also, it has enabled billions of dollars of investment in energy. Uh, that has enabled the economy to achieve highest growth rate in last 10 years. So we believe that such uh, uh, ventures of collaboration offer opportunity not for a single country, but for the whole region. We are at the intersection of South Asia, China, and Central Asia. Uh, these are still not very integrated regions, although all three are, uh, at the moment, strong engines of growth in the region, in Asia particularly. 
So through CPAC, we uh, have a vision that we will connect South Asia with China and China with Central Asia. And the three regions combined with a three billion population have a huge opportunity for the future growth of the global economy. Um, Minister Iqbal, you just mentioned the China-Pakistan economic corridor. It's, it's, a, it's a giant project. And I would argue that it also embodies um, the whole initiative. There are a lot of hope, there are a lot of benefits, but also a lot of challenges. The, the corridor travels a lot of area, a challenging area, challenging terrain. So what could be done to push this project even further down the road? I think uh, when you implement a project of this size, there are a number of challenges which have to be addressed. And I would say that there are actually many gaps that uh, we have to proactively address. First and foremost uh, is the coordination gap, because when you undertake an initiative of this size, there is uh, a coordination not only of stakeholders within the country, but also with the external stakeholders. So we have a very strong steering mechanism through which we coordinate uh, with external and internal stakeholders. And over the last uh, two years, we have had over 50 ministerial meetings, which I chair, and through which we are able to cut through the red tape and uh, inter the, the challenges of coordination amongst different ministries. So that is one very important element. The second uh, gap is the knowledge gap uh, that does not uh, uh, allow many local businessmen to also fully appreciate the opportunities that will come. So we have adopted a very proactive approach of partnering with the local chambers uh, to create a greater awareness about the opportunities that exist. The third gap, I would say, is the human resource gap that we also have to address, that while these opportunities come through infrastructure projects, through energy projects, you require different kinds of skills in the market and they are not there. So we have very proactively now beefed up our skill training programs, the human resource development programs, so that this can be smoothly executed. Uh, there are also challenges in terms of different regions, uh, where the different regions have uh, aspirations. When we started, uh, there were uh, many problems with different provinces. They all wanted to have maximum share. So again, we had a very inclusive approach wherein we brought every region into it and showed them that how these fundamental infrastructure projects will bring dividends to everyone. And now there is complete unity, harmony. Actually, every region is now competing with other region to have greater uh, opportunities in one belt, uh, one road. So uh, having open information, having better coordination, uh, making sure that human resource does not uh, uh, impede the progress of the work and taking everyone along, I think, provide good opportunities for effective implementation. And lastly, I would also like to emphasize it's not just the economic links, it is also people to people links that as a result of this uh, initiative are uh, giving us new opportunities. For example, Chinese language has now become the most important, second most important <laughs> and the most sought after uh, language program in Pakistan. So it is, uh, you know, a, a fashion everyone wants to learn Chinese language. We have uh, highest number of students now in China probably after any other country. Uh, which have come here for a, a studying Chinese language. We see that there is a fusion of Chinese and Pakistani cuisines which is taking place uh, with uh, more Chinese workers there and Pakistani people coming here. So this people to people, I think, uh, dimension is also very important. Yeah, so it's a multi-dimensional. And uh, Danny, financial coll collectivity is a very important part of the initiative. And but along the Belt and the Road countries, they are actually at very different stages of financial sophistication and development. So what kind of innovation in, in finance arrangement are needed to promote the financial connectivity and the financial inclusiveness? Minister Iqbal, please. Well, I would say that in terms of implementation and how to uh, uh, innovate for good, uh, speedy results, First and foremost, I think, is what holds true for any change management success. It is the ownership and support of the top leadership. 
It is absolutely necessary that the highest level support and ownership should be very visible and clear. In our case, it is the Prime Minister who has been personally championing the program, has been supervising, and at the ministerial level, I champion it. And that makes it very easy to break the red tape and put things on a fast track. The second important lesson from our experience is that governments have their limitations. Governments alone cannot undertake such big uh, uh, projects. So we have to open up and uh, provide opportunities for, our, for, for, our, for private sector, for our ac academia, research institutions, uh, for uh, civil society to also come in. And how can we create these collaborative spaces uh, where uh, we can pick up the brains from different uh, uh, sectors and have a collective wisdom uh, to uh, really maximize the value. Uh, all, I would also say that we also need to come out of the old uh, uh, straight jacket of looking at it as some kind of a development cheap concessional financing mode. There are many opportunities which can be done on very commercial basis. For example, Pakistan had an energy policy uh, for many years and people were reluctant to come there. We were facing 16 to 18 hours of power shortages. And what CPEC has done, it has connected Chinese investors with the Pakistan's energy policy, we have billions of dollars coming in where the investors are making, making decent 17% return over equity. And we are getting oxygen in shape of uh, foreign direct investment that is helping us overcome energy crisis. So, uh, you know, how can we uh, harness the private sector investment? How can we connect the opportunities with the external financing sources? Uh, so it should not just be seen as some kind of a development uh, project which will require government to government intervention only. I think there are many opportunities which can be harnessed by connecting uh, markets uh, with the external financing in uh, private sector mode and public private partnership mode and that will give uh, more value. Thank you. Yes. Well, I think uh, the first and foremost is, uh, as Mr. Zhang Tao also mentioned in his opening remarks, that host countries have to attend to macroeconomic stability. If you do not have macroeconomic stability, uh, these uh, uh, opportunities will have very uh, limited uh, potential to contribute. In 2013, when we came into government, our deficit of the budget was uh, over 9%. And in three years, we have cut it down to less than 4.5%, more than half. Uh, three years ago, the reserves were dwindling around 10 to 12 billion dollars. Today, they are 22 to 23 billion dollars. They have more than doubled. Uh, three years ago, the, the tax to GDP ratio had dropped to less than 9 percent. Today, it is almost 10.5 percent. So we have tried to address uh, the resource mobilization through uh, tax collection, uh, cut down the deficits, brought stability. The reserves have improved. So that, I think, uh, provides us the platform on which we can move forward. Similarly, the debt-to-GDP ratio, instead of increasing, has decreased. It is less than 60 percent, which was about 62 percent three years ago. So therefore, with uh, strong macroeconomic fundamentals, we don't have any fear of debt sustainability. And also, uh, we have recently achieved 5.3 percent growth rate, which is highest in the last 10 years. So, if we continue on 6 to 7 percent growth platform, we will be very comfortable uh, meeting these obligations. Now, in terms of private sector investment, I think Pakistan is a 200 million population. Two-third is young population. 70 million plus is middle class. Now, there are not too many European countries with that kind of, you know, uh, size. Uh, all these people want to have good quality of life. There, there is no private sector which has a global ambition can just ignore to uh, overlook uh, or overlook this market potential. So we are very attractive with this macroeconomic stability and CPAC which is addressing two bottlenecks, energy and infrastructure. And all these investments are going into uh, opening up the infrastructure and the energy bottlenecks. We are seeing that now new investment is beginning to come. Recently, a Dutch company made an acquisition of more than $400 million into a Pakistani company. Now, if CPAC was not there, I don't think that this would have taken place. Because, you know, uh, all this investment is bringing health to the economy and g giving people greater confidence in the future opportunities. We are seeing many automakers uh, now. Fiat is coming and setting up a plant in Pakistan. 
uh, many Chinese automobile companies are coming in outside the scope of CPAC. So uh, the private sector is coming in with a very liberal investment policy we have. There are no restrictions on remittance of dividends. So I think uh, we will see more and more of private sector investment come in because there are huge gaps still where private sector can come and fill those opportunities with the fundamentals that